good morning, good afternoon, good evening. There's a, uh, there's a Fiona Apple song. I don't know if you're a fan. I am. I've been a fan since I was younger. But anyway, there's a Fiona Apple song where she goes, Good morning, good morning. You raped me in the same bed your daughter was born in. Anyway, every time I say good morning on one of these intros, that's what I'm playing in my head. Anywho, so today's story, <laughs> getting to it. Um, today's story is a story that's been on my mind for quite some time. And that's because as I've mentioned in some of my previous audiobooks, a lot of these stories I actually get from my crazy dreams. So this is kind of like a open window or a peek into my effed up subconscious and my crazy, crazy dreams that I have. And, uh, this is one of those, um, you know, like the repetitive dreams that I've had over and over and over again. And whenever I wake up from it, I always think, you know, God, Shelly, you have got to make this into a story somehow. Like maybe that's why I'm having it over and over and over is because someone somewhere is telling me I need to make it into a story. But every time I go to put it down on paper or on my laptop to be more realistic, um, it just sounds so sci-fi and just like so, and not that I'm putting, I love sci-fi. I am a total, total geek. I love sci-fi, but it just, it's almost like just, it's just out of my element or kind of like out of my style. I don't know. I don't even know if I have a style at this point, but, (laughs) but when I have this dream also, I wake up and it's so real to me that I am having a panic attack. My chest is heaving and I'm like, (sighs) okay, that didn't really happen. You're home. You're in your bed. You're still in your mundane life. Everything is normal. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. So I just kind of want you to keep that in mind as you're reading this. Like this is a real dream that I have over and over and over for some reason. And, uh, you know, there could be some metaphor to it, I guess. You know, one could speculate that, you know, a a number of things. I'm not going to dive into that. I used to do dream interpretation, which I find really interesting, but fascinating. Um, But getting to it, the name of the story uh, that I wrote for you today, just today, normally I write a story, it takes me a couple of days, I take a couple of days to edit, take a couple of days to record it, make it into an audiobook, yada, yada, yada. This one, I literally just wrote this morning, a few hours ago, I went over it once, edited it, and bam, making it an audiobook now. So uh, I hope that it takes well. I hope that it translates well <laughs> from my brain to the laptop to the audiobook. That's my wish for it anyway. The name of the book is The Sky Opened. It's written by myself, Shelley Moore, for my website, LimitlessStimulus.com. In 1911, Chester Lee and Effie Adele Pittman bought 63 acres of land in Somers County, Virginia. Most of the land had already been cleared by the previous owners for farming purposes, save a small patch of forest in the back lot. The land sat atop a large hill that overlooked the small town of Owensburg, and after purchasing it, my great-grandparents built a three-bedroom house with an expansive farmer's porch on the front that provided perfect views of beautiful Owensburg below. Chester, my great-grandfather, passed from colon cancer two years before my great-grandmother Effie passed from ovarian cancer. They left the house to my mother, their eldest daughter, when she was just 20 years old. My four siblings and I were raised here our entire lives. It's the only home we've ever known. We added our own signature to the family land by creating miles upon miles of ATV trails and randomly placed tree houses in the forest we built as children. My father passed away 11 years ago due to a heart attack, and my mother remarried and moved to Tybee Island, Georgia, leaving me, the eldest of her five children, the familial house and land. My siblings weren't very happy about her decision, but she was only following in the footsteps of her own parents by passing the family home down to the eldest child. My two youngest sisters and brother haven't spoken to me in over a decade because of it. My brother Mick, who's closest to me in age, is still in contact with me, but I rarely see him as his job has him traveling all over the country selling God knows what. I never married. I never saw the point. It's not that I'm a cranky old lady, I'm only 34, but I simply believe that marriage was created as a legal contract designed during a time in which men had ownership over women. The man's surname was given to his wife, thereby replacing her own to represent his ownership over her. Slaves were also given the surname of their owners, just for the record, for the same purpose, ownership. The ring 
serve the same purpose, a miniature handcuff of sorts placed on the finger of his property to let others know she had already been claimed as another man's property. The whole thing has always rubbed me the wrong way. Don't get me wrong, of course, I've often daydreamt as a young girl about throwing a big party and dressing up in a gown we women don't get to wear these days unless we sign our lives over to our partners, but the whole thing seems silly to me even as a child. My Auntie Bess used to tell me I was a cynical little child. My mother would tell her I'm a realist. I also never had children. It was never a conscious decision not to do so. In fact, I'd welcome one if Mother Nature decided to bless me with one, but it just simply hasn't happened yet, and that's okay. It will happen if it's meant to. I believe that. I still have time, I think. My uterus is still making me miserable a week out of every month, so I dare speculate I still have at least a few good eggs left within my ovaries. Wednesday evenings, my good friend Sam picks me up in her Chevy Silverado, and we carpool down into town to volunteer at the local rec center. Sam teaches swim lessons to kids ages 8 to 12, and I teach dance and yoga classes to kids of all ages. It's my absolute favorite part of the week. From my porch's vantage point, I could see Sam driving up toward my house when she was about a mile or so out, so I ran my coffee mug back inside and placed it in the kitchen sink, grabbed my purse and jacket from the coat hook, and I locked the door behind me just as she pulled into my driveway. Seeing little Sam inside her giant truck will never not make me laugh. Samantha Sikla is all of five foot nothing and a hundred pounds soaking wet, but I've never known her to drive anything but a disproportionately large pickup truck. It's just always been her thing ever since high school. I don't think she'd even know what to do with a little sedan if you gave her the keys. Hey, good looking, she yelled out to me as, the ro- as she rolled down the passenger window while looking over the top of her sunglasses. How much you charge? You couldn't afford this. I joked back as I descended the stairs on my porch and walked toward her. She laughed her over-the-top, animated laugh that I loved so much as she reached across her seat to open the door for me as I approached. Ready for another wild and crazy night on the town? She joked. You know it. I said as I climbed into the truck and shut the door behind me. I brought a J to smoke after her, Sam said as she opened her coin purse to reveal a small, hand-rolled joint. Well, my night just got a hell of a lot better, I replied, rubbing my hands together to demonstrate my excitement. Hey, remember Jupiter's mom, Katie? Sam asked. Jupiter? Who the hell names their kid Jupiter for crying out loud? I replied as I shook my head. Katie does. She's pregnant, too. Maybe she'll name the kid Uranus, Sam said, and we both laughed like we were 10 years old. Yeah, I know Katie. What about her? I asked. She bought shrooms, the magic fungus kind. Sam took her eyes off the road for a moment, pulled her sunglasses down just low enough to raise her eyebrows a few times as she said it. Game on, I said. Are we all going to meet up at Rafi's after, I assume? That's the plan. You good with that? Of course, I replied. Hey, Tom is bartending tonight, Sam said with a tone indicating I should be excited to hear such news. Tom is a bit of a douche, I said to my friend. Tom is cute. Tom is responsible. Tom has his own place, no criminal record, and most importantly, he hasn't screwed half the town. Tom is a good catch, Beck, she said. He's not bad on the eyes, I'll admit that, I said but doesn't seem to have much going on upstairs. Who cares about upstairs, Beck? For shit's sake, get you some. She danced crudely in her car seat. You're ridiculous, I laughed as I playfully smacked her leg. We pulled into the small parking lot behind the brick building that's housed the Owensburg Recreational Center for the last 64 years, and we hopped out of Sam's truck to join some of the parents who had gathered in the lot. A few of them stood with the side of their palm up to their brow as they stared at something in the sky. "'What's new, baby blues?' Sam asked Katie as she nudged her so hard she damn near knocked her over. "'What the hell is that?' Katie replied almost in a whisper. Sam and I followed suit and looked up to the sky. The wind was knocked out of me. I struggled for my next breath. I don't know what I had expected to see when I looked up, but it certainly wasn't this— I didn't even know what this was, but it was so unreal. 
so foreign for my eyes to behold in that space that my brain couldn't quite transmit what it was we were staring at. We could see things coming toward the earth. That's the best I could describe it using what little information my brain had available. They weren't, they weren't airplanes. They weren't weather balloons. They, they, were, they were just things, metallic things. Hundreds of metallic looking things that ranged in size from small to extremely large, although small is also an unfair description because something small that could still be seen coming from the depths of space and entering the Earth's atmosphere was certainly not very small at all. It was almost as if a far off planet had cut a hole into the fabric of time and space and had dumped all their garbage into it. Some of the objects looked like jacks, the kind you play with as a child. Some looked like disks. Some appeared to be gear-like and others were smooth, shiny balls that reflected the sun's glare. Hundreds of them, maybe more, came closer and closer to the earth, and all we could do was watch, completely dumbfounded, our bodies made inoperable by our own bewilderment. When they reached about 200 feet from the earth's surface, a woman screamed. They're gonna hit us! We need to run! A man shouted, but just as he did, the objects stopped as they were and just hovered above us overhead. Many more unidentified metallic-looking objects joined them from the vastness of space behind them, and they began to collect and cover the sky as far in any direction as we could see. Imagine garbage collected on the ocean surface that spans for miles and miles. The metallic objects gathered and moved together as if they were caught atop an ocean's current. Sam grabbed my arm, but didn't dare remove her stare from the sky above. I put my hand on hers. What the hell are they? I asked. I'm scared, Beck, she said, which broke my attention away from the sky above. The Samantha Sikla that I had known for the last 20 plus years absolutely did not get scared. As I looked around me at the crowd that had gathered outside to witness the incredible sight, I had a moment that could only be described as deja vu. I knew this scene. I had experienced this scene once before, in a dream. We have to get to the house, I said quietly but firmly to Sam. I grabbed her arm and pulled her toward the truck. We climbed inside, and Sam's hands shook violently as she put the key into the ignition. The truck wouldn't start. She tried again and again to no avail. Others had follow our, followed our lead and began clam, climbing into their vehicles, but none were starting. It seemed they had all been rendered completely useless by whatever was happening above us. We have to walk. Let's go, Sam, I said, as I quickly hopped down out of the truck and ran around to Sam's side to open her door and help her out. What if we just stay in the truck, Beck? It might be safer, Sam said. No, trust me. I have a bad feeling about this. We need to get to the house, I said, as I took her by the arm and helped her out of the truck. Let's go inside the rec center. It's a brick building. It's safe. Maybe the news... No, Samantha. We have to go to my house right now, I demanded, cutting Sam off. She didn't question me. I never used her full name. She knew I was serious, and I was grateful she chose to listen in that moment versus asking me another question and wasting more precious time. We ran down Owensburg Road as fast as our legs would carry us, the house was about four miles from the rec center. We could make it if we ran. We had covered about two miles when suddenly I realized Sam was no longer running behind me. I stopped and turned, and then realized she had stopped in her tracks, mesmerized by all the cars on the road, which has stopped as well. People were getting out of their defunct vehicles to stare at the metal objects above, which were now casting shadows all across town. A baby cried somewhere behind us. Car doors could be heard opening and closing. The street lights were all out. The neon signs that normally lit up the front of the convenience store on the corner of Owensburg and Crittenden Roads were out. The only noises that could be heard were that of the befuddled people who were trying to get a grasp on what could be happening. I jogged back to my friend, grabbed her by the wrist, and gently said, Come on, Sam, we have to move. Reluctantly, she picked up her pace and began jogging behind me once again. 
Once we made it past the business district and into the residential area, I stopped for a second to give my legs a break. We sat on the cement front steps of a small yellow house that I had always admired for its beautiful rose gardens. Sam was silent, which worried me. We just need to get to the house, Sam. We'll be safe there, I assured her, wrapping my arm around her shoulders and pulling her close to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you know that, Beck? What's going on right now? She asked, tears forming in her eyes. I don't know, I said. Then how do you know if we'll be safe? We have to get to a radio. I've dreamt about this, Sam, many times. It's a dream I've had hundreds of times since I was little, I revealed. Seriously? She asked. A dream? In the dream, I'm sitting on my front porch. I see the sky open and all of these airplanes and metal things, they, they come through the hole. Those aren't airplanes, she said as she looked above us. I could feel her body trembling with fear. In the dream, they were planes. I watched from my porch as they hovered above the town for a while until I stopped. I didn't want to scare her. Until what, Beck? She pleaded. Until they didn't. They fell. They all fell, one by one, and crashed into our town, destroying it. I finished. I hadn't told her the full truth. I didn't see the need. She was already petrified. Adding to it would only increase her fear and make it more difficult to get her up and running to the house, which is where we desperately needed to be. I didn't know why the house would be safe, but I felt it. And I didn't know what other option we had. Are you serious? She cried. As a heart attack. Come on, we need to go, I said as I helped her stand. Just as we began to run again, we heard the first crash. It sounded as if something had fallen above the area where the rec recreation center was about a mile behind us. The sound was intense, and it shook the ground beneath our feet. Sam cried out, and we picked up our pace. Small metallic objects about the size of softballs began falling all around us. When they'd hit the ground, they would bore a hole so deep into the ground we couldn't see the bottom. It was as if the objects were on a mission to get to the center of the earth. If we were caught in its path, we instinctively knew there would absolutely not be a good outcome. I can see the house, Sam. We're almost there, I reassured my friend. And just as I did, one of the metallic bombs fell so close to me that I dove headfirst into a bush for cover without thinking. This had finally penetrated the hard walls of my fear, and my body began to tremble. Sam pulled me out of the bush, placed her arm around my shoulders, and wrapped my arm around her waist to get onto my feet. We ran. We reached the bottom of the hill that my house sat atop, and on the train tracks that crossed the road we needed to climb sat an immobilized train, completely blocking our path. Go under, I yelled to Sam, and we both dropped to our knees and climbed underneath the train across the gravel and hot metal tracks. I helped Sam up once she reached the other side, and we tried to run up the hill toward my house, toward safety, but our legs were beginning to tire from the exertion. The adrenaline had clearly begun to fade, and I felt as if I might vomit, but we grabbed a hold of one another and pushed ourselves forward with every ounce of strength we had in us. I, I just need to sit, just for a second, Sam said breathlessly. We can't, Sam. It's not safe, I warned, but she had already collapsed upon the grass on the side of the road. Just for a second, Beck. I just need to catch my breath, she said as she slung her arm across her face. I walked over to her and grabbed her arm. We have to go, Sam. We have to get a metallic bomb shot down from the sky and hit Sam in her gut. It tore away at her flesh, bone, and anything else that stood in its path. Her eyes widened with shock and fear as blood left her body from the gaping wound. Sam, no, Samantha, I cried as I held her face in my hands. Go, was the last word my friend spoke to me. 
I didn't want to leave her. I couldn't pull myself away from her, even as she gurgled and choked on her own blood and wheezed her last breath. With heavy tears falling from my eyes, I watched as a metallic bomb hit the train we had just crawled underneath moments before, obliterating it. A second later, another hit the front of the train, and the explosion that followed was deafening. I instinctively covered Sam's body with my own, trying to prevent further damage to my friend by the flying shrapnel the explosion had shot into the air. I caught a piece of metal no bigger than a dime in the lower part of my right arm, and I screamed out in pain. I sat up once again and looked down upon the face of my dearest friend. She had left her mangled body behind and traveled somewhere much safer than where I currently sat. Another metallic bomb dropped just inches from me and I realized I needed to leave her behind if I wanted to see tomorrow's sunrise. I cried sobs that I didn't know I was even capable of crying, but my legs continued to move in spite of my mind's desperate despair. I glanced back at my friend every few steps until her body fell out of sight. And just as she did, the objects above me began to whir and buzz. I pushed my despair aside and I pushed my body to its limits, climbing the hill that my house sat upon one horribly painful step at a time. I needed to get there. I had to get there. I'd be safe there. I just knew I'd be safe there. I didn't dare look up. I kept my eyes locked onto the house, just a few hundred feet to go. An explosion not far behind me knocked me off my feet and sent my body to the ground with a horrible jarring thud. I felt the bones in my chest crunch upon impact. My ribs had surely broken. I was having a difficult time breathing. My ears were ringing and my head felt as if someone had hit me with a sledgehammer. I pushed my body up from the ground and stood once again, one foot in front of the other, right, left, right, left. Almost there, Rebecca Jane, almost there. I couldn't hear anything other than the ringing in my head. The pain I felt throughout my body was excruciating. I made it to my porch, and when I did, I collapsed onto my wooden rocking chair. Bloody, dirty, sweaty, and barely conscious, I watched as the alien objects dive-bombed our town one after the other. Hundred-foot-tall fireballs arose from the places I had known since childhood and the homes of people that I called friends. I looked to the south, and it appeared the same fate had been bestowed upon our neighboring town, Clinton, and to our north in Batesville. I looked up to the sky and watched as more and more metallic objects gathered in our earthly atmosphere for as far as I could see. My ears rang, my limbs ached, my chest heaved, and the destruction faded to black from the outer edges in as I lost consciousness. The end. Thank you.